bone, walking and talking and touching and loving and healing and delivering. He who was spoken through the prophets was now walking by the seashore of Galilee. So we talked about that. And I showed you that light is because Jesus is that light. Say after me, life is, life is. death has. Death. Now let me explain. Anything that begins has. Anything that never began is. Example, if I say, I have, because someone gave it to me. If I say, I am, nobody gave me that. If I say, I have life, someone gave me that life. If I say, I am life, no one gave it to me, I am it. Jesus didn't say, I have life, he said, I am life. While the devil says, I have life. Why? Because the devil had a beginning. Jesus is the beginning. Frankly, Jesus never began. There's no such thing as a beginning because eternity has never begun. Are you hearing me? But it's always been. It's right. But you see, for you and I to understand, God says in the beginning. Frankly, there was no beginning. But for our sake, he said in the beginning. So you and I can hook in. You see, you and I have finite minds. Our minds have been programmed to start and finish. But when you see no start, no finish, you can't understand it. So God says, for your sake, I'll say the beginning. When there was no beginning. He said, I am the beginning. I am the end. I am the eternal past, present, and future. So he who is life saw how death in the garden began and death like a train going a million miles an hour was destroying everybody that was in its way. So Jesus, who is life, said, we're going to stop this wicked train. We have to stop this wicked force that is destroying what we've created. So for God to stop it, he had to go from this position, being life, into that position when he became flesh. And you see, death had destroyed every, every body of flesh it had ever touched. Now, this body of flesh, who is life, the train hits him and can go no further. Why? Because death can destroy life. Death can destroy the living. But death cannot destroy life. See? And when death touched the one who is life, he plagued it. Hosea 13, 14 says, Oh, death, I will be thy plague. Turn to it. I'm going to show it to you one more time. Fred, we'll go back to Hosea. Then we'll go back to Hebrews. All right? Hosea 13, verse 14. God's word declares, Jesus looks at death and says, I will plague you. Hallelujah. Okay, Fred, read for us. I will ransom them from the power of the grave. Aha. Uh -huh. I will redeem them from death. Mm -hmm. Oh, death, I will be thy plague. Oh, I like that. Keep, keep going, Fred. Oh, grave, I will be thy destruction. Yeah. Watch what he said. He says, I will ransom them. How did he ransom us? When he became flesh. I will redeem them. How did it happen? How did that happen? When he became flesh. But then he said, Oh, death, I will be your plague. How did that happen? Look at me, please, if you will. Death was coming a million miles an hour towards every human being, destroying every flesh, every body it ever touched. When it touched the body of Jesus on the cross, death was plagued forever. It stopped for good. And when his body laid in the grave, he destroyed the grave. Because death cannot destroy life like darkness cannot destroy light. You walk into a dark room and you have a light with you. That light dis destroys, dispels, removes the darkness. Isn't that right? Okay. Now, if I walked into a building that is totally dark, pitch darkness, with a little candle, that candle has more power than all the darkness in this room. Why? Because light is more powerful than darkness. The same way, life is more powerful than death. Death, like darkness, was in this world. And when Jesus shows up, he was the light of the world. And death fled from before his face. And when he was flesh, and when he became flesh and hung on a cross, see, the only way God could destroy death is for death to touch him. He had to become flesh 
so death would touch him. Are you hearing me? Hello, are you hearing me? So when death touched his body, it had nowhere to go, no further to go. He plagued it forever. He destroyed it forever. So you and I can cry today, Oh, death, where is thy sting? And when his body laid in the grave, and the grave could not hold him, because he destroyed the grave, we can cry, Oh, grave, where is thy victory? Before the cross, the saints faced the grave with fear. After the cross, we face the grave with victory. Because the grave can't hold us anymore. That's why the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Death has no power over the believer. You and I have been delivered from the fear of death. Why? Because Jesus one day destroyed the very power of that train moving towards humanity. And forever abolished it. That's why he said, Whosoever believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. That's why he said, If you believe in me, you will not die. That's why he said, I give them eternal life. That's why you can rejoice. If you have lost a loved one, the grave has not kept them. They've never gotten to the grave. They never entered into that casket. Only their bodies did. But even that he promised to raise back from the dead. Today your loved one is in glory. Having a wonderful time. That's why we read that ye sorrow not. Even as, as others which have no hope. If we didn't believe what we preach. Paul said we of all people would be most miserable. Someone asked me. You believe in cremation? Or you believe in bed. I said, brother, dust is dust. The Bible teaches burial, but dust is dust. Who cares is right. God can raise that dust back as quickly whether it's been burnt up or became dust in the grave. And you know what? All they do when they burn them is they speed up the process of the thing becoming dust. Well, what about when that dust is spread on the ocean? You think God can carry that thing, bring that thing back? I'm sure. I mean, God, don't go fishing. That's it, so he can't do that. In one split moment, he's going to raise those bodies back up. Whether in the ocean or on the land, whether they've been burned or went back to dust in the grave, he said on that day, the dead will hear my voice and be raised back up incorruptibly. You say, Benny Hinn, what will my loved one look like? Just like they looked when you saw them, except glorified. Your faces will be glorified. You see, Moses and Elijah were recognized by Peter, James, and John. You know why? Because in glory you'll recognize the saints. You will know who Moses is when you see Moses, because you'll have instantaneous knowledge. You'll know Elijah. Hiya, Paul! Why? Because Jesus one day, long ago, held death and said, you're not going to go any further. You can t take me. And when you take me, you won't take another person. And destroyed it forever. And rose from the dead to prove death could not hold him. The Bible says in Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, God, who at sundry times and in divers manners, Speak in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son. Now, saints of God, let me tell you something. Jesus Christ has three offices. Prophet, priest, king. Say them. Prophet, priest, king. Say them again. Prophet, priest, king. When Jesus came to earth, he didn't come as a priest. He came as a prophet. Today in heaven, he is not the prophet. He's the priest. When he comes back to earth, he won't be the priest. He'll be, he'll be the king. Hello? Okay, now watch this. From creation to the cross, he was the prophet. From the cross till the second coming, he'll be the high priest. From the second coming to eternity, he'll be the king. Three offices. And never do we see him mixing all three up together and coming in all three. No. When he was on earth in flesh, he was the prophet. He spoke the word. He was the word incarnate. 
Today in heaven, what is he doing? He's my high priest. The priesthood of Jesus began on the cross of Golgotha and will continue till he comes back to earth. But when he comes back to earth, he won't come back as a priest. He'll come back as the king of kings, the Lord of lords. He came in Bethlehem as the baby who became the prophet of God. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 18, 15, a prophet shall the Lord God raise up among you, Moses said. And when he was on earth, he was saying, verily, verily, I say, he was the word incarnate, the word made flesh. And I've been teaching on that for the last three weeks or four weeks, how the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And he, the word of God, walking in a body, talking, touching, loving, healing. Now, though, what is he doing? You see, this is the thing a lot of us don't even talk about. We say, well, what he did, how about now? What is he doing now? Now he is in the office of that priest. Next week, I will teach on Jesus beyond the veil. What is happening now beyond the veil? Many of us don't know. We read the Bible and say, oh, he died for me, walked by the seashore of Galilee, healed the lame and the crippled. How about, what is he doing now? He's been doing it for 2,000 years. He was a prophet. Hear this. He was a prophet on earth for only 33 years. Frankly, it was really more like three. Because for 30, he didn't do nothing except get ready. He's been a priest for 2,000 years. He'll be a king forever. We know so little about his priestly office. So the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, tell them about beyond the veil. Brother, next week you're going to leave this place shouting. Because you're going to see what the priesthood of Jesus is all about. When you see the priesthood of Christ, you'll never, ever, ever fail. Because when you see what he does, you'll not be defeated on a single score. You will never be defeated when you see the priest. You know that people who know him as prophet, but not as priest, are not complete believers. It's those, hear this, those who live in guilt are there because they've never seen the priesthood of Christ. They see the cross in the past. They don't see the present and the victory of the priesthood of Jesus. You know what he's doing for you right now? He's mentioning your name in glory. Think about it. The Bible says in the Psalms, and I don't want to begin now because if I do, I won't quit. But the Bible says that God thinks about you all the time. David said, if I would think, he said, Lord, if I would count the times you think about me, I would run out of numbers. You think more about me than there, than there are sands on the seashore. God, all the time. And we can just say all the time because that's all we understand. Even though there's no time in heaven. But if I can say it like this, every moment, even though moments don't exist in glory, because it's eternal. But every moment, he's mentioning your name to the Father. He sits beside the Father and says, Father, Father, Steve down there, let the aid quickly. I know what he's going through, Father. I, I know. And when Steve is praying, Jesus begins to intercede for him. He gets a prayer partner in the throne room of heaven. Wow, how can we fail when Jesus prays and the Holy Ghost prays all at the same time? Angels are released. He ever liveth to make intercession for you and me. Say after me, his only business is my business. Now, Hebrews 1 says, watch this. Seven revelations about Jesus in Hebrews 1. Seven revelations. Look at them. Let's look at it one more time. The seven revelations of Jesus, and you will see him prophet, priest, and king in those seven revelations. Number one, God, who at sundry times in diverse manners, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son. Say, by his son. Always remember, look at me, please. Hello, you who's. Always remember, it's of the Father by the Son that things happen. Okay? The Father is the one who gives it. The Son is the one who does it. Jesus in heaven is the doer. By him all things were made. And in the Holy Ghost all things manifest. Did you hear this? Okay. Now, now I like this about Jesus. 